Okay, there we go. Um, I got started in this when I first started scribing. Uh, I started scribing in April 2014. I wanted to do a scroll for my husband's night. I didn't have any supplies. I had a friend who was a scribe who gave me the perg, let me use his pigments. I loved it. Only he didn't have a black. So I asked who knows anything about pigments in Atlantia, got in contact with um, Lord Gaffrey, who is the pigment expert here in Atlantia, and um, talked to him about it. I apologize for the pig. We're gonna hear that a lot. So sorry, she has a lot to say. Um, he told me how to make a black, how to make a gray, and I was done. Uh, I didn't even bother with anything else. I went straight into period pigments. I was fascinated with making my own. Um, I buy most of them, honestly. It's a lot easier to buy them from somewhere like Sinopia or Griffin Dye Works or naturalpigments.com, which is my usual. But the joy and the fun of making them yourself is really what captured me. So when I got ready to do it seriously, I got the Craftsman's Handbook, the Libro dell'arte, which is the book by Sinini. In it, he talks about how to prepare panels, how to make gesso, how to grind all the different pigments. All of that stuff is in here. But it's a little medieval. You need this to go with it. This is the Daniel V. Thompson book that explains Sanini. Sanini talks about things like fat and lean pigments. That does not mean chonky. Thompson explains all of that. So both of these books, you could pick them up, both of them for 12, 15 bucks together at Amazon. If you're gonna do this, I recommend both of them just to have as a basis. So then he says you need porphyry to do this. Porphyry is that brickish red stone with a little white flex in it that's used in uh, Egyptian sculpture a lot. Super, super hard. That's why he recommends it. It's so hard, it's not gonna grind itself into your pigment as you're grinding. So you need a flat piece and a half round piece that'll fit in your hand so you can grind it. Today, we use a glass plate and a glass molar, or a glazed ceramic plate and a glass molar, or any number of other things that we can use because we are creative anachronists and porphyry is cost prohibitive. Um, here's some of the stuff I use. I love a little granite plate. Granite plates are great. It's the second hardest thing. So it's good to use for that. I have used hard stones that have a flat spot. I like a little piece of granite. Granite on granite's gonna grind. That's a weight from something. I found it at a flea market. It's full of lead, it's brass, it's lovely. It smashes things and then it grinds them flat. My favorite molar is a croupier's weight. Um, found it at a thrift store. Use a little sandpaper on the bottom to get it super smooth, but um, matte finish. Grind it on the granite. It's so comfortable in the hand. You don't have to grip it like this, like a molar. You can grip it like this. Oh, love that thing. Weighs nothing. Cost me 15 cents. So the process, it involves taking a stone of some kind. And there are a lot of stones that were used in period. I grind everything just because I want to know. I'm curious like that. You've got to smash it into pebbles, smash it into sand, then grind it from sand level 
down into powder as fine as talc. Stone is not pure. No stone is. Lapis is the most expensive of all of the period pigments because there is so much impurity in the lapis that has to be filtered out. And that filtering takes massive amounts of time. I'm gonna grind a few things, but first I wanna show you some of the things that I've ground. Then we're going to grind some Verona green earth or green sand or boho green. There are a lot of names for it. It is either glauconite or celadonite. Um, the glauconite is more of a sagey green in the boho green kind of color range. And celadonite has a little more teal, a little more turquoise to it. It's um, the same color as the historical Korean pottery. All right, so let's look at a few things. Let's compare it to dirt. Dirt processing. It's dirt. I dug it up. It's a pretty color. I like it. I have to soak it so that it becomes a muddy pudding. Then I put it in a piece of trashy linen. Gather it up, run water through it. I usually put the linen down in a chinois or a sieve or something and run water through it. When I think I've run enough water through it, I can gather it up and squeeze the bowl and squeeze the last of the water out. That takes a big tub like this because you're gonna gather a lot of water in it. Stone doesn't take a big tub like this. Stone doesn't take your hands in water all the time. But it doesn't take as much effort to do this. This is time, stone is elbow grease. What comes out into your pot is the finest of the clay. What's left in your fabric is the sand and the grass and the poo and whatever else is in it. Then you take that, put it in a mortar and pestle and you grind it till it's super, super fine. But they're not the same color. You've ended up taking a lot of things out of the dirt that give it its color to get this color. And every dirt is different which is why this is a red oxide and this is a red oxide. And I had another one that's scary, scary red, but I don't see it now. They're different colors because they come from different places. They have different minerals in the soil. Rocks are the same way. Let's go back to lapis a second. Lapis also has sodalite and pyrite in it. Pyrite is the little gold flex, the fool's gold. Sodalite has a, a darker, deeper, kind of navy indigo blue, a white clear crystal, and a black specky particulate, which is really super hard. All that has to be filtered out of the blue. The nice thing about it, just like dirt, is that each one of those minerals, each one of those particulates has a different weight. It has a different hardness. So as you grind, you can filter out the stuff you don't want. How many pounds is this? Seven and a half pounds. I paid $12.50 for it. This is commercial fertilizer. It's also glauconite with potash. That's all it is. It's glauconite. It's the green earth we want. If I put a little water in it and I stir it around, I can get the potash out of it because the potash is going to float the sand 
is going to go to the bottom. See how filthy the water is? But the sand is down there in the bottom. I'll wash this, wash this, wash this, pour the water off, wash it again, wash it again, wash it again, till all I'm left with is the green sand. Now it's ready to grind. Pour what I washed off into my mortar and pestle. I keep a little water in it. I always keep water in my mortar and pestle. It does not matter what I am grinding. Soil, rock, any of them. I like to keep water in it because it keeps the dust down and it keeps whatever I'm grinding in the mortar and pestle instead of everywhere. Water is also the best at erosion and it's natural. It's not gonna change my pigment, but it's also gonna help me. Uh, so this actually has a little too much water in it right now, but this does not work. This is stirring. This is making batter. I do this. I put it up against the edge and grind a little bit here. And then I get a little bit more and grind and a little bit more and grind. And I grind against the side back and forth like this because when it stops making noise, I know it's where I need it to be. Now we're going to pour some of this off. I'm gonna show you how to separate it. I said the particulates have different weights. This is all a glauconite. It's going to grind a little bit at a time. To get what I've already ground out of the way, put a little water in it, pour the liquid off. Now I have pigment suspended in water and the sand I still need to grind because it's not ground enough left in the mortar and pestle. Grind, repeat. Grind, rinse, repeat, grind, rinse, repeat until everything is in the bucket. Now even this is not all the same. Here is some that I ground and poured off and it dried in its little cake. This is what I want. That smooth, flat, beautiful pigment. On the bottom is the little bit of sand that got poured in when I was pouring things off. So I want to scrape this until I get to this. Then I have my pigment that I'm ready to start painting with. Something like serpentine. This is serpentine. You can very much see that there's two different colors in there. And they're very, very different hardnesses. The yellow grinds super, 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 super fast. So as you start this process of pouring things off, it's going to start with pollen yellow water. But the more you grind, the green also grinds into it. And what you're left with in the end is that color pigment. And it's kind of a sagey green because you've gotten the light yellow and the dark green together. If you don't want that, pour the yellow into one pot, keep grinding, pour the green into the other one. It'll make two colors. The yellow will have a little green in it, the green will have a little yellow in it, but it will make two colors. Azurite is like this. Azurite is a mix of the blue in lapis and the green in malachite. 
and they weigh different things. If you just grind your azurite, put it all in the same thing, make paint out of it, every time you put water in your paint pot, it'll separate out. The blue will sink to the bottom and the green will float in the paste on top where your water is because they weigh different things and you've got to continually stir them back into solution to have an even color. Or as you're levigating, which is what this process is called, you separate them out into the green and the blue. Make sense? Sound cool? All right, here we go. Let's do a little grinding. Hey, Bubba. Yes? Is one of those greens the one that gets like, a, turns a completely different color when you get it wet? Um, they all turn a completely different color when they're wet. Hold on a minute. Um, I showed you, here'd it go? Oh, this, this is the pigment, okay? All paint is tempered. That doesn't mean it's tempera, it means it's tempered. This is pigment, this is ground serpentine. It's that green and, and yellow stone I just showed you. If I put binder in it and make paint out of it, it's now this color. The binder changes how light hits it, how light is absorbed, reflected, refracted, depending on what kind of rock it is. Malachite, the green, the dark green beads that people wear, is a soft seafoam green paint. The reason malachite is green, when you look at it, is the concentration of the copper salt captured in the crystal structure of the stone. As you grind it, the crystal structure gets smaller because each particulate gets smaller and has less and less and less crystal in it. That also means it has less and less and less copper in it. And in theory, you can grind malachite until it looks white because it gets so little copper in it that the light, when it refracts through it, is no longer visible as green to the human eye. Under a microscope, it's still green, but to you, it will look white, like talcum powder, because you ground it too far. Makes sense? How much, how much of the, um, which binder you use changes oh. the color? So if I was um, gonna do egg tempera versus um, um, Arabic, how much is that gonna change it? All of them are gonna change the color and make it darker. Just like, um, when paint is wet, it's lighter, and when it dries, it's darker. When pigment is dry, it's lighter. When it's in paint, it's darker. Um, with egg, you can use the yolk, which is egg tempera. That deepens the color and enriches the color. It makes it look slightly more vivid, and it has to do with the protein in the egg yolk which is very, very different than the protein and um, the stuff that makes the white sticky, the albumin. Glare is egg white and glare makes it shinier, but it doesn't make it richer. They're both gonna make the pigment darker, but the overall finish is different on the two. And gum arabic, is a little picky. Gum Arabic gives you uh, a darker color, but you have to be careful with it. Different pigments react differently to it. Um, if you put too much gum Arabic in it, it gets super, super shiny and glossy and brittle, and it will flake off. It looks like super glare. And if you put too little in it, I don't know if you can hear us, you're frozen. Half pigment powder, half gum arabic. And I always use the powder 
because when I, when I mix those two things together, the pigment breaks up the gum arabic. Because when you gum got, arabic is you're wet, froze, after, froze up for a minute, so we lost part of you. Yeah, oh, you okay. froze after too little gum arabic. Too little gum arabic, um, it gets chalky and it dusts off. It doesn't create a firm binding if you have too little, which makes sense. Um, when I mix any pigment, don't care what its source is, I mix half pigment powder and half gum arabic. Put them together. I always use gum arabic powder. I don't, I don't like buying the bottled gum arabic liquid. It's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't like it because I'm not sure what the concentration is. I'm not sure what the water is and what chemicals are in the water. I know what's in my well water at the house or in the distilled water I got out of the plastic bottle. And I know exactly how much gum powder I've put in if I do it myself. So I mix half and half powder and get it wet, let it sit. Give it a day, sometimes two, depending upon how much liquid is in it and how much the pigment loves water because period pigments can be hydrophilic or hydrophobic. They may take a lot of water because they just soak it in, lead is that way. Um, or they may not like water at all and it may be very difficult to get the mix in solution. Charcoal is that way. Um, I give it a day, let it dry out, let it form a leather hard surface. Like in pottery, you want it to be leather hard before you start to put it in the kiln. Um, if it is shiny and glossy at leather hard, I have too much gum. I put a little bit more water, a little bit more pigment in it, stir it up, it'll be fine. If it's cracky and dry, I don't have enough gum, wetten it, put a little more gum in it, then it will be fine. Um, and after that, keep track of what takes more gum, more pigment, where your balance is, and you just get used to doing it. And, and you'll just know, well, I got to mix more of this up. It's going to take more gum. Glauconite, this green that we're going to make in a minute, it always takes more gum. Um, it loves water. It soaks in water. It's sold as a fertilizer for dry soil because it absorbs water. So when it dries, it dries in these little chunky, hard, crunchy things. The more gum you have in it, the smoother it is when it dries. Was there another question? We good? Okay. I'm rinsing the potash out of the glauconite. Pour the nasty water out. We'll do it one more time. My water is almost clear coming out with a slight green cast to it. I can see that. You may not be able to, but I can see that. That I went from being cloudy and brown to clear with a light green cast to it, which means the majority of my potash is out, if not all of it. And um, I'm, I've activated the glauconite a little bit. So this is now ready to put in the mortar and pestle and grind. And we're gonna do that. You wanted to know about stone stone. This started out as stone before it was commercially ground into sand. But we're gonna take a hammer to some stone here. Yay, fun, make noise. Because I'm all set up with my stones and my pestle and everything. All right, I've got my granite slab. What shall we smash up? I can, uh... oh, I know what I want to smash up. I'm so excited. I have to share this with you. This is the best thing ever, 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 ever in the history of pigment. This is my special magic box. There were uh, a couple of twins in 
another Canton in my barony who had been watching me make pigments online and were so fascinated and so excited that they asked their mom at six years old if they could go around the neighborhood and gather a box of rocks for me to make pretty paint out of. And their mother painted the box and gave it to me. And this is my precious, precious box. And I love this. And occasionally I'll get something out and smash it. That's pretty. It's not going to make a pretty pigment. And I know that because the color in it is only a medium teal to start with. And there is so much white in here, so much crystal that being able to get just that pigment out is going to be incredibly difficult. And if I grind it all together, it's going to be too light to really be worth anything. So this will never come out of my box, but I will always have it to love. Something like this. It's darker to start with. And yes, I have some black impurities that I'm going to have to filter out, but I'm much more likely to get some kind of usable pigment out of this than this. Does that make sense? Okay. So. I don't want it going all over the kitchen. So I'm going to wrap it up and see if we can smash it. What are you wrapping it in? It looks like a piece of fine leather. Yeah. It did not smash well. That tells me two things. One, there is a lot of white in here in the dust that has been made. So even though it looks bright red, it's a crystal that has stuff captured in it, like malachite, like the teal one we just looked at. So when I grind it, I'm going to lose a lot of my color. And two, as big a chunks as I've still got, the grinding is going to kill me. So it's not worth it to do this particular rock. Make sense? So let's find something else. You go over here. This is raw turquoise, just little turquoise beads. This is much more like malachite. Turquoise and malachite are um, copper salts, just like lapis and azurite. Let's see how this does. It smashed a lot smaller. These got pushed out of the way of the hammer, but these smashed really well. I've got multiple colors in here. So I know now I need to separate them out, like do this one with its friends and do this one and this one together to limit my having to separate out colors. If I keep all of those together on one side and all of these together on the other, I'll have a deep gray, sagey green out of these, and I'll have a much brighter, lighter turquoise color out of these. I also have little tiny dust that's still green, so I know this will work. This would be a better choice for me to grind. Everybody good? Uh, you go over here. This is soda light. This is what you take out of lapis. This is what it looks like when it's ground. It's a light, fine, almost not blue. Because even though this is very, very blue, when you grind it, there's a lot more of this white crystal. This is like that red we looked at. The more you grind it, the whiter it gets because there's really very little of this blue in there. So Sodalite, 
not worth it. There's a reason they throw this away when they process lapis. All right, here we go. I don't have to smash the glauconite because it is already in sand form. This is where you need a Netflix subscription. There, there's a lot of this that goes on. It takes hours and hours and hours, but it takes very little effort. I'm, I'm really only tensing up my fingers. And the more I grind, you can tell that the color is coming out. This is the pigment that I'm gonna pull off into the bowl. Then I can put more water in it and keep going. And I will go and go and go until I've either done all the sand or I've decided I've done enough sand. Even as pure as glauconite is, there are harder particulates of it. There's a certain point where you go, mm -mm, no, I'm done. I'm throwing that little bit away. It's not going to hurt anything. Malachite is very much that way. Malachite is striated. It's got light green and dark green stripes in it. The light green is softer. It's going to grind right away. The dark green is harder. It has a harder crystalline structure in it, which is why it's darker green. There's more concentration of that copper in it. Um, it grinds longer and you can keep grinding and keep grinding and keep grinding, but there's a certain point where you just decide, I don't care anymore. I'm throwing it away. And that's perfectly okay. Waste is part of this process. There's always waste of some kind. It's either at the beginning where you're pouring off the stuff you don't want, like getting the potash out of this commercial fertilizer or separating the soda light out of lapis as you process it at the beginning. Or there you get down to that last little bit and you realize these are rocks and they're always going to be rocks and I don't care anymore and you throw them away. All right. Go back to our bowl where I had stuff poured in. Can you tell that stuff has settled in the bottom? See where it's settled? There's a line here where it started to settle out. There's still pigment in this water, but if I let it sit an hour overnight, depends on the pigment, it settles out completely. It will fall to the bottom, pour the water off the top. Then you can assess what you've got. Just like this cake, where that's fine and this isn't, you're gonna have some it's fine and some it isn't in here. So you may want to swirl it all up and then pour this water off into something else, which is going to leave the sand in the bottom. Or you can pour it all in and do the scrape the cake. If you choose to regrind this, you can. If you don't want to, don't. You have pigment. You made it. It's right there. It's ready to go. Questions? Anybody? Any questions? What type of mortar, mortar and pestle are you using? Because I've, I've seen some made out of porcelain and I'm, I'm always worried that that would be too soft for this. Okay. Sanini says you need a brass one. And I have a brass one somewhere sitting on this table. Brass is great. This is um, a pharmacist's mortar and pestle. Uh, it's tall and you can take the 
and do some extra crushing if you need to. But it's not very good for the grinding. I don't like it. I don't like the height. I don't like the narrowness. I, I would never grind in this. But if I need to go back and crush something a little bit, I can crush it without it flying out the top. I have porcelain ones. This is porcelain. I probably got 70 or 80 mortars and pestles, by the way. Shh. Um, well, maybe not that many because I keep giving them away, but you know. Um, I don't like these. these. This is a modern pharmacological mortar and pestle set. So it's porcelain glazed on the outside, but unglazed and on the inside also unglazed. I don't like them because they're too shallow. They're made for crushing pills in. If you're just crushing a little chalky pill, this is great. But for what I do, I, I get busy doing this and I tend to push it up out over the side. Otherwise they're fine for it. They will work. Um, I've got ones from World Market, ones from the thrift store. Yes, they work. I just don't like them because of the shape. I prefer one of these. I like this shape. This is marble. This one's marble. I like this shape because they're deep enough. They've got a nice bowl to them. They're dished out the right way. Marble is softer than granite. You have to be careful with it. Um, but it works. I've done everything in my marble mortar and pestle and I have no problem with it at all. And it's more about the shape than it is about the material to me. My favorite is this bad boy. This is porcelain. This was handmade for me to my specifications by a master potter here in Atlantia um, who swore he would never do it again because porcelain is soulless. Um, and God bless him. He's right. It is. So I treasure this thing. I have gotten to the point, I use it so much, I can tell by the sound, if I'm sitting watching television, I can tell just by doing this and listening to it, it's time to move to another section, I'm done with that part. And I can hear it because I've gotten so used to it. You know how you do with your favorite tools, you just get used to their soul and how they speak to you. Um, so it doesn't matter, use what you want. Except wood, wood is bad. Wood is bad juju magumbo. Wood will come apart. Um, I liked my glass mortar and pestle for the fine end of, um, my husband's in here, sorry. Sorry guys. For the fine end of rinsing and pouring off because it's clear and you can see where things are settling out just like we can see where things are settling out in this. Sadly, it gave up the ghost. I'm a little heavy handed. Anybody else? I have a stainless one. Now that'll work fine. Uh, it should. Um, I don't know if it's gonna have enough tooth to it. The porcelain is microscopically bumpy. The marble is also that way. It's the um, stainless. The it's stainless not a grit, in, like not a grit, but it's you can see where it's been tooled. It hasn't been smoothed. It's matte inside. Um, my only concern is that those are made for grinding spices and crushing herbs and so i don't know if it has the right kind of tooling to do I, what you wanted to do and grind something into powder try it and see okay. try anything. my my goal the reason i got the stainless is i'm not making pigments i'm actually trying to extract the minerals to embed into glass so my concern was the contaminant like if i'm using a, a lead-based uh crystal i didn't want to use something that would allow the lead to get into it into the porous that's surface right. so that's why i went with the stainless so give it a shot and see okay um i am a strong believer in the sea big 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 believer in the sea and not in the um 
modern toss-up way. I know a lot of people go, I'm a creative anachronist. I'm going to use this. That's pleather, sweetheart. It's, that's, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not that kind of C person. I am, um, I am in the camp. My first peer said, if they'd had sewing machines in the Middle Ages, they would have used them. Uh, and she also said, there's two reasons to do anything. One, for use. The other, for show or competition or reenactment. If you're entering a sewing competition, sew it by hand. If you're going to wear it water bearing, sew it on the machine. That makes sense to me. I'm all about that. Um, I'm going to have a hand ground pigment. I'm going to be using a period method to grind it. I'm going to be using a period binder to bind it. I'm going to be putting it on with a modern paintbrush on vegetable parchment. I'm okay if I picked the rock up out of the backyard and, and didn't do everything perfectly period on the way there. Use the stainless steel one. If it works for you, it works for you. One of the things that um, I've liked to point out in the past is that even Sanini specifically says, here's how you do this thing. However, store-bought is actually better. Go find a good dealer. Holla, preach it. Um, I like to try it. I tried lapis, I tried azurite. Now, there are some things I absolutely love making on my own. We have a, a master sword maker here in Atlantia. Um, and he goes out and gets iron ore from defunct iron mines. And when I run out, I'm like, Mark. And he brings me a gallon bag of bright red iron ore and bright yellow iron ore, which is where yellow ochre comes from. And I love doing that and being able to source something from where I live and transform it into something knowing that he uses the same thing and transforms it into something completely different. That's awesome, love that. But it comes out two colors, a tomato and a rust. Sometimes I need a maroon. Oh honey, naturalpigments.com, please take my money. Send me some Armenian red ochre, please. It's the color I want and I don't have to make it. Absolutely, go to town. That's what money's for. Have you, have you ever been out to the Hidden Night Mine? No, I haven't. Uh, there's a Hidden Night Mine in Alexander County where you can go and get stones. Um, cool. It's, it's, it's really neat. I've taken my kids out there. I don't know how many times. I probably should bring you some bags of rocks. We have time. Um, I like making pigments from <laughs> baronies. So I stopped and got some dirt in Carmare at the oldest surviving plantation home in that area. Um, I was in Steerbach and they have a lot of gray stone in Steerbach. So I picked some up, brought it home. It makes a gorgeous, deep, rich, wet cement colored paint. Fantastic for horses. Oh, not much else, but fantastic for horses. So awesome topic on the topic of making pigments from places um i'm the individual who did the 50-year dirt project i know <laughs> i sent I you have, bags of stuff i you did uh yeah um i have a big box of dirt from around the known world and i'm moving and don't want to keep it would you like it it's sure. all tagged with where it came from and almost oh, everything fantastic I'll, 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 I'll talk later. My mailing address <laughs> after this. Now, now I, hopefully, the Canadian post office is better than the U.S. post office. They did not understand why I was sending little bags of powder in the mail. And telling them it's dirt did not make it any better because it made no sense to mail little baggies of dirt to anybody either. I, I went, so when I was mailing my faience kit, what I do is uh, Egyptian faience, which is the mm -hmm. precursor to glass for everyone else in the chat. 
and uh, it's basically silica and a bunch of rocks and some soda. And it's basically white powder. And mm -hmm. so I had these 100 gram baggies of white powder that I was trying to mail to Penzik so I could go and teach my class. And I'm like, this is not going to go well. So I went to the border services directly and said, hi, I'm trying to mail something to the States. It might be problematic. Can you help me find the right code so that people don't have issues? And they're like, oh, just look it up. It's fine. And so I go and take one of the baggies. I just plunk it on the table and he just kind of takes one look and goes, oh, I'll help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually have the printout from Canadian Border Services with the right HTS codes and everything and how to package it so it doesn't get any white powder leaking out of it. <laughs> the things we deal with in our hobby, I swan. <laughs> and then proceeded to, to send, you know, six kilos of faience to Penzik. <laughs> I will tell you, you can make pigment out of any kind of soil or rock. You can. It's not worth it like that redstone or that bluestone that we looked at. Sometimes you just have to. I had a king dare me to make um, pigment out of the, uh, the dirt in a horse ring once. So I did, it's a beautiful bunny rabbit brown. I swear it's the horse apple in it. Any more questions? Sorry, I had to un unmute myself. Um, this may seem like a ridiculous question, but how long does dry pigment last? Forever. Okay. As long as you um, can dry. I was gifted like a whole set of colors from natural pigments when I moved uh, back to the east from Atlantia. Uh, <laughs> um, I used to live hey, in Storvik. Um and so I have little sandwich, like little snack size Ziploc baggies of like <laughs> 20 pigment colors. Um, the vapors. You need to stop now and just get on with the question. I'm going to um, find you and hijack them. <laughs> I'm in Boston and this is the guest room. Um, <laughs> um, basically they've been sitting in, uh, in the baggies, in glass bottles for the eight years that I've lived in Boston, is there any reason to think that there's an issue with them? They pull bottles of pigment out of Egyptian tombs and use them, it's fine. Okay, cool. <gasps> Yay, I need eggs. There are, there are a <laughs> few that you need to be careful with. Right. Um, verdigris, which is the, the blue stuff that grows on copper and brass. Mm -hmm. Over time, as it is exposed to air, it gets darker and goes back to a dirt penny brown. Okay. So if it's a little dull, it's a little dull because it's been exposed to air. <laughs> um, the mercuries, which is uh, vermilion, vermilion, and cinnabar. cinnabar, all of those. Mercury lets off mercury fumes, something. So make sure when you open it, you, you're opening it outside in the open air okay. so that whatever air has been captured in there escapes somewhere other than your home. Right. You know, there are a few things like that, but as a pigment ready to make a paint, go ahead, go for it. Okay. Yeah, they're fine. Yay, Thank you, Mercury, because I'm using other uh, mean or other uses for my pigments. Um, can you send me a list of which ones are the mercury ones so I don't set them on fire? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> I have no idea which ones are mercury based. I was going to go and go on the natural and just buy a bunch more, but grind a bunch. There are, there are the think of that. <laughs> people are terrified of them. People are afraid. Oh my God, it's poison. It's poison. Yeah. And it's the, the, it's the fact that I'd be studying a lot of fire. It. The, the MSD sheet with the vermilion says don't drink it. Okay. Um, and in the grand Don't scheme of things, I, I could, I could probably lick some lead paint and not die. I might get a little sick, but I'd be okay, mostly. Um, or I could suck down a little tiny tube of cadmium red 
oh, your modern safe paint, cadmium reds. Yeah, you're going to need a kidney replacement because it's just radioactive enough. Enjoy that. Mm. The poisons do not bother me. They do not frighten me. If they do, use a modern gouache. Be creative with the sea. Invoke the power of the sea. Use a red gouache. It's okay. You can but get artificial. Um, you can get artificial cinnabar and artificial vermilion mm -hmm. on some of the online sources. Yeah. Think about it this way. For, for my purposes, though, it's it's the actual chemical binding of the lead or the mercury or everything that I'm trying to get, um, and then setting it all on fire and basically aerosolizing it, and that is really, really bad and slightly illegal in Canada. Yeah. If you if you are looking for the chemical reactions, you yeah. need to go 100%. If you're looking for the color, be afraid of the poison. It's fine. Use a modern replacement. Johan Q. Skadian wants the red on his AOA scroll to be the same as the apple barrel craft paint from Michaels that's on his shield. Windsor Newton makes that color. Lucas makes that color. Artist Sloth for Michaels makes that color. None of them are poisonous. Vermilion, scary poisonous. It's okay, don't use it, it's fine. Um, if anyone is interested in the chemistry of what goes on and the physics of what goes on and the crazy weird stuff we pigment people get into, I run period pigment palette with Ian the Green uh, on Facebook. You are welcome to join. It is the most magical rabbit hole of science fascinating what goes on on that group. So please join period pigment palette. Anything else? This first hour is about up. It's going to go for about an hour and then repeat if we had more people join. Um, one other question is I have instead of a marble slab, I have a slate slab that's meant for countertops. Is that hard enough? I would not trust slate. I wouldn't. I, I think it will powder off. I don't think it's got the right hardness. What do you, but um, when, you were, when you were pounding your rocks? Um, I sometimes wrap it in fabric and just do it out on the concrete front stoop. Okay. I'm like, it what can off. I get while I'm stuck in isolation? <laughs> um, do you have a concrete slab? Yeah, yeah I can do that. Uh, you know what else works? If, for for minimal grinding is the glass plate out of a microwave out of an old microwave will also work as a um mulling stone mine's more the the, the crushing i'm my rocks are all big the smashity smashity the smashity smashity part okay hardware stores are open do you have a uh stone place stone tile granite countertop place possibly yeah i went to my local stone tile place and said, hi, I'm an artist and I grind my own pigments and I need something to grind on. And I also need some little samples to be able to teach others how to do it. They sold me a $15 double sink cutout of inch and a half, two inch thick granite. That thing is glorious. And then they said, oh, and the dumpster's out back. Go have fun. I have a huge box of little cutoffs of different sizes and colors and little brokeny bits. It's fantastic. Yeah. My, Not my, only that, if you have this and you're willing to clean up some mess, you don't need a mortar and pestle. You put the rough pigment on the unpolished side and you go with the unpolished side. So it seems to stop making noise other than granite on granite. Then you scrape it off and you put it on the polished side and the polished side and you do it till it stops making noise and it's ground. The problem with that is it, it, it goops off the side and you gotta keep scraping it and putting it back in the middle. 
but it's worth it. So a big hunk of granite and a little hand-sized chunk of granite, you're good. So I was starting to say, my boyfriend got me a piece of granite countertop like that, that was like almost a foot square for me to use for leatherworking. Um, Same thing. At, at Lowe's, and it was just a broken sample. It was mm -hmm. just a little place in it, and they just... Yeah. Bought. That's what you need. Yeah. So a lot of places just will have it. I know a small one, like what she has, like from the leather store, they charge you like almost 20 bucks for, whereas ah. you go to the counter place and, and get a much bigger piece, a lot cheaper. And if you want something smaller, some of those are broken. They're in their dumpster, you know. Pardon me. Can anyone hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, this is my first time on this. Um, you just met this, I joined late, sorry, it's fascinating. Um, and you mentioned about having to make, do your paintings with modern paint brushes. Mm -hmm. I make paint brushes. I have used period paint brushes. Yeah. Uh, I had someone who made some for me and I loved them. Yeah. Um, for, I normally have big long fingernails and I yeah. also have mild arthritis. So I have gotten to the point where I, use the ergonomic paintbrushes, the ones that have the, it's almost like a pencil gripper in the middle, so that I'm okay. gripping here instead of here. Okay. It's much more comfortable for me. Hmm. I love period paintbrushes though. Well, you've given me a, a challenge because I have a friend who suffers something fairly similar. So, oh, I can already figure out a design. Um, Hang on, I'm gonna vanish a second. I'm gonna chime in here and say that I'm hyper mobile, and I don't know if you can see me on my screen, but I hold my pencils and stuff like this, which really yeah. Great. So I would also be interested in something. Ooh. Like that. See? Okay. That's quite different from anything I had envisioned. Uh, I actually thought. But it's lovely. What brand is that, Baba? I have no idea. Um, Amazon special. Let's sweat it. Um, this one is Dartisan Shoppy. D apostrophe okay. Artisan Shop P E. Okay. Um, but I have three or four different brands. I just whatever pops up when I say miniature ergo paintbrush. Oh, ergo. I. I have some that are a full set of all the sizes because you can get them in a 10 pack, 12 pack, 15 pack, depending upon what you want. Mm -hmm. And then I have some where I, oh, I like that size. That's my best size. And I'll get a six pack of just that size because I know I'm going to wear them out. All right. This is so, something that, oh, go ahead. This is something I'm just getting into this, this whole new thing. And right now I'm using twigs. And yes, the, the grip is very tight. Um, so you've provided me with something to really consider with the idea that you want a really fine paintbrush, but then a big grip, correct? Find something, find a stick with a knot in it or where it's got branches coming out and you can cut it off and, and have a little, even a little knob. A lot of pen holders are that way. They'll have a little knob or a little grippy where you, where you grab it so you don't flinch down on it as hard. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, something to explore. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Not, not for me. <laughs> Should I go through things again or do we want to wrap up or what? Oh, I can hear you talk all day. Oh, I could, I could, I could talk all day. Okay, how about I end the recording and then we just kind of do free form. You guys, this is an unlimited chat, so we can go indefinitely. So, sure. uh, yeah.